critical that people understand that sound uh, preceded light, God's voice that let there be light, and everything in Genesis is a command. And so, you know, in the old days when lasers were coming on, light amplification by the simulated emission of uh, radiation or stimulated, I guess, and then masers, you know, microwave amplification, then what's happening, I, I think that people must understand, is there's a direct connection between sound or frequencies of matter. There's a direct uh, relationship between the ancients, if you will, the antediluvians' ability to use harmonic levitation. By the way, this isn't psychic stuff. This is physics stuff. And the point that is really critical is that now the gates of hell are literally open. And, you know, I've heard some, quote, scholars say, well, we've got that all wrong. I want you to explain to people the revelation that you've gotten on the gates of hell, because I think it's pertinent for people. You know, a gate can either hold something back or allow something through. But it's critical, because even even in Jerusalem, the physical Jerusalem, uh, there are gates. But explain, if you would, your take on the gates of hell and exactly why, whether we want to get into the CERN, Dr. Lake, or go wherever you want, okay? The, the, the podium and the microphone is yours tonight. But, again, you've got a massive amount of people dealing with particle physics, whether it's CERN or the other uh, the thing in Jordan called Sesame, kind of like a 1001 Arabian Nights, uh, Ali Baba and his 40 Thieves, uh, basically the door to get the genie to appear you had to use the magic word, open sesame. So, uh, you know, give us your take on the gates of hell, because God said they're not going to prevail against us, but we better learn that they're going to try and seek the Lord for the ability to deal against them. Go ahead, sir. Well, biblically, and, and when, you, when you look at ancient cultures, whenever they talked about the gates of hell within their gates, it wasn't just physical gates that there were chambers within the gates that you would have the judges, the elders, the key leaders of a city. And so whenever you would talk about coming against the gates of something, it wasn't just the physical gates, it was all the, the councils of, of that city or that nation. And so when Jesus said that the gates of hell would not prevail against it, he was actually speaking beyond where the disciples were when he said this with, at Mount Hermon that the watchers, for the, the most of the leadership of the watchers were incarcerated. We know that from the book of Enoch. And so the early church never faced the full council of the gates of hell. In the last days, well, and I dealt with this in my, in my first book, that there, there is evidence both technologically and with preparation of what the elite have been doing, they expected the watchers to begin to be systematically released around the beginning of the 20th century. And so when you deal with the gates of hell, um, you know, Jesus went to Mount Hermon, which was ground zero for the watchers. You also had the Grotto of Pan. You had the entrance to Hades there. Uh, you had Nimrod's fortress that was built on top of, uh, of there. And if you look at topographically at Mount Hermon, you will actually see on one side, you will see a goat's head in the topography Many believe that that is the area that Azazel has been incarcerated by Almighty God. And so Jesus could not have chosen a more strategic place. But guys, we need to understand that when we're dealing with the gates of hell, we're dealing with Lucifer, we're dealing with the Nechesh of the garden, that seraphim that came down in his fire, we're dealing with the watchers, we're dealing with principalities and powers and rulers of darkness, and then what's interesting, what, what the Apostle Paul reveals in Ephesians 6, where he talks about spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, that's not dealing with an entity. That's dealing with what I call the iniquity force. It, it's Satan's black river of power that flows through the second heaven. That we're going to have to stand off and face all that and the technology and everything that that brings. And when you understand that rulers of darkness, cosmocrator, and in, in the Greek, deals not only with a throne of power, but could actually deal with the with the planets that are in our solar system. That when you begin dealing with higher spatial dimensions, you begin dealing with the second heaven and third heaven. That time is different because of the resonance of, of within those dimensions. They have there. There's a different relationship with time. That when you get up to the third heaven, once it seems like a thousand years to us, is simply one day to them there. 
uh, when you, I, in fact, I believe if you're in dimension zero, which is which is hell, one day to us may feel like a thousand years to them. But also, distance is different. That's why, you know, when, when someone's translated by the Lord, God simply brings them up into the second heaven and moves them an inch and sets them down, and they appear on the other side of the planet. So there can be things in the planets on a second heaven level that deal with the things that are going on here on earth. So things are, could get real sci-fi on us real quickly. And I, I think that's what they're counting on is that we're not prepared for what's coming. D- Dr. Lake, I just have a question, if I may. Um, the second heaven to which you refer, is could you, would that also be um, analogous to a second or, or a, another dimension, or is that something different? It is. Uh, in, in, uh, on page 29 of my book, in the Sherith Imperative, I basically try to unify super string theory in the Bible. And that when super string theory tells us that there are 11 dimensions, 10 are dimensional, and one is temporal. And I suggest that there's actually one that they, they never count, which is dimension zero, which would have no expression within the physical realm. And that's where God would place hell. And so we, we have, after the fall of Adam, when God placed that flaming sword, he separated the three heavens. We have access to the first heaven, which are our three dimensions plus time. So when you go up higher than that, you get into the astral plane or the place of the second heaven. And then you go up even higher than that, you would reach into the third heaven. But what's interesting, it's like laying three sheets of acetate together. They all take up the same space, but depending upon how you resonate with the speed of light, that, that really causes you to have access to those different dimensions. Okay, I understand. And Denise, Mark, Jared, and Larry uh, from the United States, Canada, uh, the U.K., as well as New South Wales. So there you go. Steve, I'm going to kick it back to you, sir. we got about uh, four minutes to the top of the hour. The reason this stuff is relevant is because Daniel was told by the messenger, the angel, uh, the Holy One that was that Daniel was told to seal up Daniel the vision for he is yet for an appointed time. And Doug, in my position on CERN and all particle reactors and all subatomic physics has been from the start of uh, talking about it. Obviously, CERN wasn't in the works 25 years ago, but the whole idea is to basically thrust mankind. Uh, God gives people in uh, time and space the potential to exercise their free will. And your free will is interesting. Imagine, if you will, uh, uh, and I'm going to use a word, a matrix. I don't mean this in any form of New Age term, but just imagine a multidimensional chessboard and where every square intersects with another square, both above to the side of it, on top of it. That's your free will. What you determine and how you respond to the choices presented to you, and let's just call it this, time-space events determines the, uh, if you will, the ongoing pattern that's developed. That's why when people uh, either have a near-death experience or do have a near-death experience, an after-death experience, they say their whole life passed before them in an instant. When you take out time and space, you, you're dealing with eternity. And see, when we're talking about superpositioning, string theory, let me just make it easy. The most beautiful example of superpositioning in the Word of God is where Jesus said, if we're in him, you know, and, and the book of Acts said, in him we live and move and have our being. Jesus said we're seated in heavenly places, that where he is we may be also. And that's mind-blowing. That tells you that in order to occupy that realm of space, heaven, and eternity, and even the time we experience as a mystery, God has done something marvelous through the new world. You know, Dr. Lake, this is my number one uh, desire, is that when we talk about stuff like this on any radio program or interview, we put the wow for the living God back in people's hearts. We put the explosion of praise. How marvelous are thy works, O Lord. Because we're, we've been fed, no offense, not, not even baby food, you know. I, I'd say this. When you, when you put rats in a pulpit, you get nothing but rat poison, okay? And I'm not saying everybody in the pulpit is a rat, but I'm saying there are rats in the pulpit. And instead yeah. of feeding uh, 
God's people, the true word of God, the bread of heaven and living waters, they're feeding people rat poison. So this is why it's critical that we talk about, like I've said many times, and Doug, you've heard it, I'm sure Dr. Lake, people can quote Ephesians 6, walk away and think that's spiritual warfare. What we're doing is warning. God says, surely he will do nothing except he reveals his secrets to his servants of prophets. Neither Dr. Lake or I are saying we're prophets. What we are saying, though, is the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, and he's the one who loves his sheep, and he's the one that gives us power.